ask you to turn in your Bible to uh, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, where we'll begin the lesson this morning. Good to see you. Very thankful we have some that uh, have been away from us that are back, and we're mighty glad that you're here. Pleased for the presence of each one. Um, Matthew 27, you know, uh, in our classes, we've recently been going through the story of the life of Christ. I know the adult class is uh, one quarter ahead of everybody else, but uh, the other classes are studying uh, the story that's told here in Matthew 27, uh, even now. And it's a great story, a powerful story, a, a, a meaningful story. Uh, Matthew 27, beginning in verse 1, when the old translation reads, And when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel together against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him unto Pontius Pilate, the governor. And then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See that or that? And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and they said, It's not lawful for, to put this into the treasury because this is the price of blood. They took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. And then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. <laughs> This story um, we read many times, but it's always curious to me, verse 3 in particular. It's curious to me, Judas is, uh, his, uh, in the first place, his surprise. And then I think also his sorrow. One of the modern translations reads, when he saw what happened, he was very sorry. And we think, you know, how, how foolish could you be to not expect this to have happened? You're, you're surprised that he was condemned? Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, his sorrow, which turned out to be anything but a godly sorrow. I want to think with you just a minute today about Judas's short-sightedness uh, as uh, a man and the tragedy that that uh, really brought in his life. And it's a great learning lesson for us. In the first place, when you think about Judas, you think about the story of a man who went from being a disciple of the Lord to being the ultimate hypocrite, to being a betrayer. Uh, it, it was not, uh, uh, there's no doubt about that. You know, there, there's some attempts that have been made in the last a number of years to try to make Judas a good guy. <laughs> it, there's, there's nothing good about what he did or about his role in this story. In John chapter 7, uh, Jesus himself once said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? You're an adversary to good and to truth and to me. Uh, but it, it was not always so. If you look back in Matthew chapter 9, um, the, the picture here is uh, earlier in Jesus' ministry. And, and the, the multitudes are coming to Jesus. Uh, and he's moved with compassion uh, at their, their hunger for right. And he says in verse 37 to the disciples, Truly the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. And then chapter 10 just continues that story. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Uh, and then he names them, including Judas. Now the, the moniker in verse 14, uh, verse 4 rather, is that Judas Iscariot, who, was, who also betrayed him, but that was much later. 
Uh, at this point, Judas is one of them, working shoulder to shoulder. Jesus says to them, I'm going to send you out, not by the way of the Gentiles or the city of the Samaritans. Right now, I'm sending you to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go, preach, say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devil. Now, that's Judas, among others, doing this special work of the Lord. But um, things changed over time. And it's hard to know exactly what day it changed or when it changed. But if you look over in John chapter 12, it's quite a, a, a sad revelation to us here. This is uh, quite late and just uh, before Jesus uh, was crucified. This last week, the Saturday, I think, in fact, before he would be crucified that next Friday. He comes to Bethany. He comes to, uh, to eat dinner with Lazarus and with Mary and Martha. And verse 3 says, you remember, that Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. But, you know, there's always a critic. I don't care how good or how pure or how noble the deed is. Somebody's going to tell you you didn't do it right. And that, on this occasion, was Judas. Now, the other accounts tell us, of course, that the disciples, plural. But I think Judas spearheaded this. And, you know, once one starts criticizing, criticism is more contagious than the common cold. And everybody now has got something to say. But Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, he said, verse 5, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Just a little note. I, I don't know exactly how much money that was, but there are sources that would suggest that a pence was about a day's wage. 300 days wages. I don't know if he was exaggerating or not. Do you think this, this uh, was worth 300? I mean, a year's wage? And to pour it out upon Jesus? Uh, what a waste. Well, that's what Judas was claiming. The Lord didn't feel that way. But uh, Judas said, well, we could have uh, sold this and given it to the poor. But John, in retrospect, writes, he said this not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare that which was put therein. I don't know who the disciples were that joined in the criticism. John might have been one of them. If so, isn't that something? You ever been in that situation? I wish I'd say I hadn't, but I have. Where I just totally misjudged a matter, and I ran my mouth when I should have been quiet, and I criticized what I shouldn't have criticized. But at least John had the grace later to recognize when all was revealed, you know, the, the, what I was praising was really evil. And the man that I thought was had the right idea was just as wrong as he could be and rotten to the core. Life will teach us lessons that way sometimes. And that was true about Judas. Um, stealing? I've often wondered about, we don't have time to explore all the details of Judas' life, but you know, you, you, you're stealing from the bank. What you going to do with it? I mean, you're going to buy a new car? What do you, what do you plan to do? Well, obviously, by the time he started stealing, he's already made up his mind. He's leaving. I don't, I've wondered where he kept the money. How did he, I, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't matter. But he's putting some money aside for himself at this point because he's made up his mind already that he's going to leave and leave this life and leave this circumstance and leave Jesus. And he's going to take something with him for all this time he's spent. I'm sure he justified it, by the way. You know, no thief's a thief in his own mind. He's uh, Robin Hood. He's doing good with it. Or he, it's coming to me. Uh, so anyway, here's Judas. And he's gone from being the miracle-working miracle disciple of the Lord to being a thief who's already in his mind gone. It's just, it's just the time is not right yet to let everybody else know. And by the way, they don't know. And, and when, uh, in Matthew 26, I think this is the passage again, when... When Jesus begins to um, reveal uh, to the disciples, might have been one of the other accounts, uh, 
when uh, Jesus begins to reveal to the disciples uh, about uh, one of you shall betray me, they all looked around. They said, well, what are you talking about? Nobody thought it was Judas. Even when Judas got up and Jesus said to him, what, what you do, do quickly. He got up and left and nobody thought, well, he's, he's up to something. Not Judas. He was a hypocrite who was good at being a hypocrite. And the outward front was there and everybody was fooled except the Lord. And I tell you, it takes a hard heart to do that. I'm telling you. It, 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 that's a, that's a hard-hearted individual. The passage in, in Matthew 26 is uh, the, uh, the, the, the picture there of Judas actually going to the process, not just of leaving, but I'm going to turn Jesus over to his enemies. And uh, I think there are reasons for that. I, I think it had to do with the fact that Jesus had embarrassed him in that story we just read a moment ago. Called him down, slapped his hand, and he didn't like that. It's the last straw for him. So, Judas is now uh, going to out himself and start his new life. I want to remind you and me that, that hypocrisy is a poison that will absolutely rot you to the core. And you'll wind up doing things you never dreamed you'd do once you surrender to that. And it happens over time. I think it happened that way with Judas. It was moral compromises. It was swallowing your conscience. You know what's right. You know that's not right. But I, man, I got this one time and, and you know, and I, it'd be hard not to do it. And we do what we know is wrong. It's like the old fellow said, if you quit one time, the second time will be easier, and the third time easier. We know that's true. And that's why, you know, in Romans 14, when Paul is writing about eating meats, uh, I think he's talking about the Jewish dietary laws here, and how that uh, even though those converted Jews were no longer under those laws, if their conscience troubled them to eat this food, don't eat it. Even if it's not against God's law, there's something wrong with doing what you think God will be displeased with. And I think that's the, the context of the statement in, in Romans 14 when he says, he that doubts, verse 23, the last verse there of 14, he that doubts is damned if he eat because he eats not of faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If I do what I believe displeases God, even if God doesn't care about it, but I have that intention of disrespecting him, it makes it so much easier the next time and the next time. And here's the truth, though it seems impossible. We can become as hardened as Judas was. It didn't happen with Judas at one time. Something else that I need to remember too. He wasn't the first and he wasn't the last to choose the path of hypocrisy. We can read about hypocrites throughout the Bible. You know, the, just looking at the New Testament, the religious leaders... Jesus warned about in Matthew 23. These were the people who ran the Jewish religion, as it seemed. They were the folks in charge of the synagogues, in charge of the temple. And they differed with each other, but they had this in common. They were all about show. The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do. But don't you follow their example because they say and they don't do. They bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne. Put them on men's shoulders. But the things that they, they, they laid, uh, laden others with, they wouldn't, lift with, they wouldn't make the effort of lifting their finger to move them. These people are about rules for you and not for me. And everything they do, verse 5, they do to be seen of men. They wear the special clothing and the garments. And they love to sit in the chief seats and they love their religious titles. And it's just as, 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 as carnal as it can be. And Jesus said, don't you dare, don't you dare give in to that. It wasn't just among the religious leaders, the opposition to Jesus. It was among Christians in the first century in, in Acts, chapter, yeah, Acts chapter 4. 
You know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. We remember what they did. Their sin was not, of course, that they just gave a portion of the land, but they loved the glory that was coming, they thought, to some who were giving great sacrifices and they wanted to pretend like they did. And, and Peter said, you lying to the Holy Spirit? I mean, how, how hardened are you to, to, to love the glory of men so much that you would just lie to your brethren, to the apostles of the Lord, to, the, to God? All for show. Uh, Acts chapter 5, the story of Ananias and Sapphira then uh, being uh, uh, struck dead, as the occasion was. He, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. Hypocrisy. I tell you, you read the story in Galatians 2. It seemed like we were just looking at this not too long ago, and maybe in your classes you were covering this recently. But the story of, uh, of Paul going to Antioch, and uh, after they'd already been through all of this controversy on the part of some trying to deny fellowship with Gentile Christians unless they became Jews first, here we find no less than Peter, the Apostle Peter, and uh, his hypocrisy of abstaining from fellowship with the Gentile brethren had infected folks like Barnabas. These are not just uh, run-of-the-mill people. These are extraordinary men. And where did it all start? It started with Peter being concerned, what will these folks from down south think of me if they see me up here with these Gentiles? And then, here's Barnabas who gets wobbly because he's one of, instead of thinking about what's right, thinking about God and truth, caught up in hypocrisy. That's the way Peter, Paul described it in verse 13 there. That same apostle Peter knew he was wrong. And later he would write to the brethren these words. Don't you find that interesting that Peter, having been stung by this sin in his own life, writes these words by inspiration, get rid of all evil and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander and yearn for the milk of the word like a newborn yearns for for food. Act like you've, you've experienced the kindness of the Lord. In that same letter, a little bit earlier, he wrote, you purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere, unfeigned love of the brethren. brethren. Love one another with a pure heart, fervently, earnestly. John also wrote about these things. First John chapter 4, he said, if any, he doesn't use the word hypocrisy here, but we know what he's talking about, don't we? If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He that does not love his brother whom he's seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. Jude wrote an interesting uh, statement about that by inspiration in his little book, the letter there, verse 12, as we, we divide this letter. He talked about the enemies of the truth, and he, said, he talked about those in the church those among the brethren. And he said they are hidden reefs at your love feast. That's an interesting expression there. I've I, not spent much time on the water, uh, but uh, I think all of us, whether we have or not, know the danger of the, of the hidden reef. If, uh, if a boat gets too close to it, it can destroy the hull. It can, it can, it can sink the boat. And he said that's these brethren. They're hidden reefs. They are hidden danger. He said, they, they feast with you without fear at your love feast. People have written a lot of words about what the love feast were, and I don't know that I know for sure, but it could well be as simple as saying the Lord's Supper. That's a love feast, isn't it? That's something we do. We come together. Uh, but whatever it was, let's just say it was the Lord's Supper. It reminds me a little bit of 1 Corinthians 11, reading from a few minutes ago, where here are brethren who are taking the Lord's Supper, but they have no shame. Uh, and their, their life and their treatment of one another seems to affect them not at all. No conscience about taking the Lord's Supper and just acting like, well, everything's fine. A hypocrite. He said they're, they're like uh, 
clouds without water. They're like fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Paul certainly wrote about this subject in Titus chapter 1. He wrote to Titus about some that claim to know God, but they deny him by their actions. They are detestable, disobedient, disqualified to do anything good. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, hear again these words. Paul writes, if anyone doesn't take care of his own relatives, especially his immediate family, he's denied the Christian faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I don't know why they stuck the word Christian in there, but anyway, uh, I think that's the, the, the summary of the, of the point. That he is a man who claims to be in the faith, but he denies the faith by the way that he lives. He's living a life of show. He's living a life to impress men. But he's not impressing God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, he wrote about some that maintain the outward appearance of religion. They have a form of godliness. I think that's the way Paul in the old translation is written. But they will have, but... Um, will have repented its, or reputed, I'm sorry, its power. They've turned away from the power for the appearance. That's the essence of hypocrisy. Romans chapter 2, you remember Paul in a scathing statement, looks to the Jews who thought maybe they didn't need the gospel like uh, those wicked Gentiles did. He said, you're convinced in your own mind you're a guide to the blind and a light to those in darkness you don't live it. He said, you preached uh, that someone else should not st steal. Do you, do you steal? You, you tell others not to commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Because you know and say doesn't mean that you are. Found in James, you know, James had a lot to say about that as well. What's real wisdom? James, in James 3 is talking about some who desire to be teachers. They don't know the top from the bottom. And he said about them, if you're looking for real wisdom, it's found in, in the proof of a life. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, he should show his works done in the gentleness that wisdom brings. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfishness in your heart, don't boast and tell lies against the truth. That kind of wisdom doesn't come from above. It's earthly. It's natural. It's demonic. But there is jealousy, and where there is jealousy, he says, and, and selfishness, there is disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, accommodating, full of mercy, good fruit, impartiality, and not hypocritical. You know, even churches, you know, the, the Lord talked to the church there at Sardis and said, you have a name, a reputation, but you don't live it. Even churches can, I suppose, be caught up in hypocrisy as a whole. I want to come back here at the end to, to look at Judas and to, to go back to, to what we talked about earlier. Judas as, as the, the, the archetype for a hypocrite. And like all hypocrites, he is manipulative. How in the world could he keep the fellow disciples in the dark about his real character? Except by being careful, uh, covering his tracks, you know, making sure he keeps his lies straight, hiding and sneaking around. That's how a hypocrite operates. One way with this one and another way with that one. And I'll tell you one of the things that I think is true in every case like that. People who follow that track all on some level think they're smarter than the people they're fooling. Isn't that obvious? We, we think we're so much smarter than these other people that uh, you know, we, can, we can play their little game, but really we're above it all. And, and, and you know, I, I wouldn't want to limit myself like these poor people do. I, for my own purposes, will play this game, but I, I think I've got a better way to live. Don't you think that's always the part of the hypocrite? But what we realize about Judas was that Judas thought he saw more. He didn't see nearly as much as the true disciples did. 
He was short-sighted. He didn't see. I'll tell you one thing he didn't see. He didn't see the cost of leaving Christ. I don't know why, I'm not sure, maybe you are, why Judas made the decision to leave Jesus. Um, you know, people have offered several possibilities and maybe there's some truth to them. I don't know. You suppose he just didn't fit in with the other guys? You notice the fact that it seems like all the other disciples were from Galilee. Judas Iscariot, you, you've noted before that the word Iscariot seems to be tied to a little village, Carioth, man of Carioth. And Carioth was in Judah. So maybe that was the pro a, a part of the problem. That Judas, you know, just he, maybe he didn't come from the fishing business. Uh, well, not all the disciples did. But he didn't come from the same part of the country, and maybe he just felt like an outsider. I, people sometimes do quit because they don't feel like they fit in. They're not thinking about the higher things. They're thinking about things that are not really important. Maybe it had to do with, uh, with opposition from without. Maybe it wasn't any problem in the group. It was just, I'm sick and tired of uh, fighting this fight every day. And I, th I, thought, I thought we were going to have the kingdom of God here. We were going to be sitting on thrones. And, and, and now we got everybody chasing us down. We can't even go to Jerusalem. Afraid we're going to get killed. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Maybe it did have something to do with uh, looking for a throne, an earthly throne, an earthly. Certainly Judas was a man who had a covetousness about him. And you know, when money becomes more important than what it is, uh, it can become our God. And maybe that was a part of Judas's problem. He thought, I am never going to make any money with this group. This is not a life to make money. All this last shall be first. Ain't going to buy the house I want to buy. Maybe that was it. I, I, for whatever reason, whatever Judas thought he was giving up by holding to Jesus, what he came to realize, of course, was, and we see that by his end, we just read in Matthew 27, the hopelessness without Christ, the sorrow without Christ, the guilt that, that overwhelms a man. Don't you think about David in the Old Testament? Great Psalm, Psalm 32, where David's looking back on his, uh, his time away from God. David spent a lot of time with God, but he spent time without him too. And he never forgot it. Before I confessed my sin, this is Psalm 32, my bones felt limp. And I groaned all the day long. Night and day your hand weighed heavily on me. And my strength was gone as in the summer heat. I trust there are a lot of folks in this audience that can relate to that. Maybe it was before we became a Christian. Or maybe there was a time as a Christian we just were not living as we should. And we, we thought we had our reasons and all that. But I tell you, you, at some point, you just can't distract yourself from the guilt that makes it feel like every bone in your body hurts. Or the joy. I remember the day I obeyed the gospel. And I remember the joy that I felt after that happened. I remember the first fellow that came up to me and shook my hand and called me brother. I remember that. I remember that now. That's a long time ago. And sometimes we can get so distracted like Judas. You know, we think about, oh man, I just don't think I can carry this load anymore. What kind of load are you going to be putting on now? Unspeakable. Here's something else that he seems to have been unaware of. Was the pain that he would bring upon Jesus. That seemed to bother him, didn't it? We go back to, to, to 27, uh, Matthew 27. Uh, when he saw that he was condemned, um, I don't think that Jesus, Judas ever hated Jesus uh, in his own mind. And, and what he expresses here is surprise at the outcome. I don't think he's being disingenuous. I think this is true. And you say, how could a man go to the enemies of Jesus and he knows their murderous intent, sell him out as he did, and then be surprised when Jesus winds up in the dock and winds up with a, with a death sentence on him? Well, 
I think probably the same thing you do, because he had been with him. I didn't list the passages here, but we could have if we wanted to take time, go back and look at the stories of Jesus, and they wanted to throw him off the hill in Nazareth, and they had him to do that, and he went through the midst of them. I believe, as sure as I'm standing here, I can't prove it, but I believe that Judas fully expected when he was betraying Jesus in the garden, they would never take him. Okay, I'll identify him. I've given you the signal. What a signal, by the way. I'm going to go up and give him the kiss of greeting like, he's, like I'm so glad to see him while I'm betraying him to his enemies. And I'll earn my money, but you guys will never get your prize. But they did. I think that shocked him. Even though Jesus had told them, told the disciples over and again, he would be taken, he would be tried, he'd be crucified. They, they could not believe it. Not just Judas, none of them could. But when Judas saw what he had done to this man who had been all good, even Judas had to admit that, I betrayed innocent blood. It, it tore him up in a way he couldn't foresee. And I think about that and I think, are you and I too blind that we don't see we do that to Jesus? When we behave in a devilish way? When we deny him? When we fail to, 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 to follow his will? When we say no to him? I think the passage in, in, in Hebrews uh, 6 is... is maybe sometimes misused and misunderstood. I, I don't think the point in Hebrews 6, this is in verse 4 of the old translation, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing that they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. He's not denying that it's, po that it's uh, possible for a man uh, who's committed evil to turn and come back to God. No. There are too many verses that say otherwise. But the point is, I believe, that, that God reaches us with the message of the gospel. And if we, knowing that, seeing that, turn away from that, there's nothing but that to bring us back. There's nothing but that to bring us to God. If that means nothing to me, there's no other hope for me. But he does talk in that passage about putting Jesus to an open shame. And I think there are a lot of folks who are not considering the shame that they put Jesus to when they look at the cross and say no thanks. So having confessed his name the confession of Jesus as Lord that every Christian must do to become a Christian every one of us to become a child of God must confess the Lord is a vow that he is my Lord I believe him and I owe him everything and for me to make that vow and then turn away from it do we hurt the Lord any less do I, do I, am I so blind I don't see that? Am I just distracted to the point that I don't see the damage that I do, not just to myself, but to innocent blood? Finally, I think he just did not see the grace of God. Because his sorrow that we read about there, of course, didn't lead to, to good. It wasn't a godly sorrow. We all think about Peter and the example of Peter in Luke chapter 22. The Lord had told him, Peter, you know, the rooster won't crow twice in the morning. You'll deny me three times. Three times that you know me publicly. And you can read that story in the Gospels. You can read it in Luke about how that repeatedly he was asked the question, uh, you're one of them, aren't you? No, no, I don't know that man. I don't know him. You talk like him. You must. You're from Galilee. I do not know him. And he began to swear. God do so to me. I do not know him. And you remember Luke is the one who tells us that as the words are coming out of his mouth and, and he's here by the fire and Jesus is someplace but within eyesight, eye line, 
being tried in the house of Caiaphas. That while the words are coming out of his mouth, somehow they locked eyes. Jesus turned and looked him dead in the face. I don't know him. And what does the text say? He went out and he wept bitterly. But here's another part of that story that you know. If you look in John's account in John chapter 21, Peter didn't go out and hang himself. In fact, later on, um, they encountered the Lord at the Sea of Galilee and they were eating together again. This is the resurrected Lord. And as they died, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? And you know, there's a question about whether he's asking, do you love me more than you love the fish and the fishing business? I don't think that's what he's talking about. Maybe it is. But you know, Peter has said, Lord, if all these folks, they may run off, but not me. I'll be there at the end. I'll die with you. You love me more than these, Peter? I think Peter felt the sting of that because he answered back, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Love is, is a different word there. He said, well, then feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He said, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. And Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Are you, are you my friend? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then he told him, he said, you know, Peter, right now you go where you want to. And, but he said, one of these days you'll be taken somewhere you'd rather not go. And he knew he was talking about his death. You ready to die for me, Peter? You ready to live for me? I, I want to say this, and I, I don't think you disagree with me. I realize all of the prophecies concerning Judas and better a man not been born than what happened to Judas. Amen. But it did not have to be that way. The devil entered into Judas. Yes, he did, but he didn't come without an invitation. He didn't come without the door being unlocked. Everything that Judas did was his choice. And even after the garden, he could have been the greatest example of God's grace I believe that. I don't believe it was too late even for Judas except by his own stubbornness, his own choice. So what do we learn from Judas? It's a lot more expensive to leave Christ than it is to serve him. And we cannot leave Christ or say no to Christ without slapping him in the face, without putting him to an open chain, without crucifying him afresh. And if anybody doesn't deserve that, it's him. That's what my sin is. That's how ugly it is. And thirdly, don't ever let the devil tell you if you've done wrong, you might as well keep on doing wrong. If I played the hypocrite, I need to lay that down now and never go back to it. If I'm not putting him first, now's the time to make that change. It may be my last time to make that change. May the Lord help me to learn the lessons from this most tragic figure, self-destructive. I think we're told his story in such detail so we will not make the same mistake. God help me, God help us to learn that lesson. I appreciate your kind attention. Please get out your songbooks. Please do at this time turn to the number that Donald has selected. If it's your desire to obey the gospel of Christ, Now's the time. But come all the way, not partly, not uh, in pretense, but in fullness of heart. If you're here as one who, as a child of God, has made that commitment, but you've not been faithful to keep that commitment, then make it right with him. Make it right with him. And he, he longs to receive you. Don't let the devil tell you otherwise. And if we can help you, we long likewise to help as well. Let us know. While we stand and sing, will you come?